Hi and welcome to the second session in our ORE tutorial videos. In this one, we're going to talk about how to price a trade and get an NPV. Of course, ORE can handle much more complicated stuff. You can have simulations and XVA calculations, market risk, initial margin calculations. There's a whole bunch of things, but those will be dealt with in another session. So for now, we're going to focus on NPV and the inputs required. Okay, so let's look at the um, ORE.xml first. It's the master file. It has been talked about in the equity video as well. So I will just look at it briefly. As you can see at the top in the setup part of this uh, XML, you have all the inputs, you have um, the date, uh, your market data, whatnot. In the markets node, you can define how the trades are calculated. In our case, this is all set to default. You can define your own settings there, but for this example, default is best. And in the bottom, we have three, in the analytics node, three outputs, which is the NPV, the cash flow, and the curves. All of these inputs, and will be talked about a little bit later, but just to give you an overview, this is the master file, the ORE.xml, where you have to put in everything that is needed to price the trade. Okay, so let's look at how the swap is actually set up in ORE. Um, as you can see on the right, we've tried to visualize the swap and what it means. We have a notional of 100 million. We were starting an end date. These dates are a little bit in the past because our market data is from the past, the market data that we use for the example that this is all based on. And this is just supposed to be a plain vanilla swap, paying 2% annually and receiving the Euribor six months semi-annually. So in ORE, we have a file called the portfolio swap.xml. Um, this file usually contains all the trades inside of a portfolio. Um, for this example, we only have one trade. So under the portfolio node, the main node, we only have one trade. So if we would collapse this, it would only be one trade. Um, on the top of the trade, we have the ID, which has to be unique, and the trade type which defines on uh, what kind of trade it is and how the pricing engine will treat it later on and what kind of algorithms are used to price the trade. In the envelope, we're not going to look too deeply into that because that was mentioned in another video. This contains data regarding um, netting sets, counterparties, which is really useful for um, netting effects and for wrong way risk and for the whole counterparty risk calculations. But for now, since we're talking about NPV, Let's look, let's look at the swap data, which is the main meat of this whole exercise. So as you can see under the swap data node for this trade, um, we have the leg data. In our case, we have two instances of leg data because we have two legs. But of course, you could have a swap with three legs if there is fee payments or some other things that would be... Um, uh, interesting for the pricing you could also add them but for this very simple example we only have two legs the first leg is the fixed leg as you can see from the leg type the second one is a floating leg um, the payer is just the direction of the trade so in this case payer is true because in this example we pay the fixed amount and uh, here it's false because we receive the floating amount then you have the notion of 100 million euros um, you have your day count conventions, you have your payment conventions, the following, you have your rate, the fixed rate, which is defined here, and then this scheduling data. So the scheduling data can be set up with rules like it's done here, or you could also input each um, payment date individually. If you have a setup which is not based on rules, you can define and specify each payment date and the um, corresponding conventions and, and usages you want. But in most of the cases that I've seen so far, we use rules to set up the swap. So in this case, our fixed leg pays annually. So we have a tenor of one year. We have a target calendar. We have certain conventions. We have term conventions. We have the forward rule. If um, a payment hits um, a weekend or a holiday, and that's basically it to set up your fixed leg of the swap. The floating leg is, is very, very similar. It has the same inputs, basically. It has the notional, it has the day count conventions. The only difference is that you have an index for your floating leg from which the forwards are calculated. 
We will go into a little bit further details on that later. Uh, for now, let's say this is a euro six months and we don't have any spread on this curve. So there's a little bit of more information. So we're saying that this is fixed in advanced and paid in arrears. That's why we set the in arrears flag to false. If you would set this to true, the fixing would happen at the end. But that is very rarely the case in, in real life. And we have a fixing lag of two days. So this is all the information needed to calculate the float lag. The schedule is also similar. You have a safe, same start and end date. It's just that you have a six month tenor and you have modified following conventions, which is a little bit different from the fixed lag. I think we should probably quickly mention the pricing engine. This is defined in the pricing engine.xml. And as you can see for a swap, swap, there's not too much information in there. There's a discounted cash flow model and it's a discounting swap engine optimized. So um, all the details can be found again in the user guide, of course, for um, models with optionality. If you have an, a CDS involved, things will get a little bit more complicated, but for now, this is all you need. And all this information, again, can be found in the user guide. And uh, we will now look at um, the conventions and at the curves in a little bit more detail. Okay, so let's look at how the curves are actually set up in Open Risk Engine. As you can see on the example on the right here, we need two curves to price this relatively plain vanilla swap. We need the forwarding curve, which in our case is the Euribor six-month curve, and we need the Euro OIS curve for the discounting. So if we look in our curve configuration XML, we can see that we trim the information down to exactly these two curves. We have the Euro six-month curves here at the bottom, and we have the OIS, the one-day curve here at the top. Um, usually this file would be much bigger containing all different kinds of curves, but because of this trade we don't need anymore, we're just going to have this uh, to make it easier to look at. So the information contained is, of course, um, the currency uh, for which this curve is defined. We have the ID, which in this is the Euro 1D. Um, we have um, the description that it's bootstrapped from Ionia swap rates. Further down at the bottom, we have the inputs which are needed to bootstrap the curve. So we have a one-day money market quote for the OIS, and then we have um, all the um, OIS swaps that are needed or that are used to actually bootstrap the curve. And we have the conventions, which are the Euro OIS conventions, and um, more information on how uh, the interpolation is done, um, the tolerance level for the bootstrapping, at what point the algorithm says, okay, you know, my curve is now good enough, we can stop the whole um, recursive algorithm. Um, at the bottom, exactly the same thing. You can see the ID is just different. The currency is, of course, the same as the euro. Um, uh, the ID is the euro six month. And you Looking at the discount curve settings, so each of these curves um, has a discount curve um, attached to it. In the one day, in the uh, Ionia OIS curve case, it's the same curve. So if you have an OIS swap, it will be discounted with the same curve. In our six month Euribor case, we also have the one day Ionia discount curve. Um, again, we have a quote of the six month rates and we have a bunch of swaps which are used for the bootstrapping, and of course the conventions are a little bit different. Okay, so let's look at the conventions for the curves and the inputs that we use for this case, for this example case. Um, as you can see, we trimmed this file down a lot as well. So the information is stored in the conventions.xml, and we have three parts. We have the deposits, the OIS quotes, and the swap quotes. And these are the conventions used for each of these instruments. Um, I think it is mostly self-explanatory. Um, in OIS, we have a payment lag of one, which is defaulted down here on the swaps. We again, similar to the setup for the schedule of the trade itself, we have a calendar, we have a frequency, we have um, the modified following conventions or just the following conventions and uh, certain other informations uh, which are needed. I think 
Most of it should be self-explanatory. Of course, you can always look into the user guide to see what options you have to put into each of these um, um, uh, parameters. Um, it is explained quite well. If you would open up the user guide, you can see that there is like for the end of month, if this is set to true or not. What happens if, um, if it's not set, then the, what the default value would be. So basically the setup for the conventions is not different from any other finance system that you might have seen in, in, in your career. And um, all these things should be self-explanatory. Another thing I wanted to mention is that you have the ability in Ori to print out um, the cash flows and the curves that are used to the pricing of the swap. This can be especially useful for troubleshooting if something is off, if you don't know why some numbers uh, don't um, you know, get calculated the way you would expect them to be. So if you not only set NPV to active in the master file, in the ORE.xml, but you also set cash flow and curves to active, you will get an output file, which you define down here. And this one will tell you um, exactly like what is used for the calculations. For the curves, you have to define a grid, which tells you how many time steps you want to see and what the interval in between the time steps is. So you have one month time steps, you have 240 of them. So in total, this will give you um, 20 years of data for the curve with monthly intervals. If we look at the output of, of these calculations, for our example, we can see that in the curves file, we have the OIS curve on the left and the Euribor six months curves on the right. And you can see how the curve was bootstrapped and what the actual curve used for pricing is. Looking at the flows output file, you can see that the fixed payments are at the top. You see the coupon of 2% that we defined in our portfolio.xml. You see the accrual period. And over here, you can see the discount factor for each cash flow. Um, at the bottom, we have the floating cash flows projected from the forwarding curve. As you can see, the accrual, accrual period is roughly half a year, where it is one year roughly, depending on, the, uh, on each year, on the top. And then on the right side, you have the present value for each cash flow. So this is, I think, a really useful tool for troubleshooting. And to check our numbers, I just calculated the sum of all the cash flows which should align with our NPV number that we get out of the calculation. And as we can see, it does. So I do believe this to be a good thing. <laughs> it seems that the system works. So this is the end of this tutorial. Thank you for watching. I hope you got some information out of it. Please watch the other videos on our website, uh, which explain other things in more detail, and we will keep on updating them to give a full picture, hopefully, soon.